She was a little girl and she was crying. The bells of the church were very loud outside and she imagined they filled the sky. There was an open space in the wall high above her. She could see the stars through it and they gave light to her room. From the reeds which formed the ceiling, a scorpion came crawling. He came slowly down the wall toward her. She stopped crying and watched him. His tail curved up over his back and moved a little from side to side as he crawled. She looked quickly about for something to brush him down with. Since there was nothing in the room, she used her hand. But her motions were slow, and the scorpion seized her finger with his pinches, clinging there tightly, although she waved her hand wildly about. Then she realized that he was not going to sting her. A great feeling of happiness went through her. She raised her finger to her lips to kiss the scorpion. The bells stopped ringing. Slowly, in the peace which was beginning, the scorpion moved into her mouth. She felt his hard shell and his little clinging legs going across her lips and her tongue. He crawled slowly down her throat and was hers. The first sky he saw was the sky above New York. Winters it snowed, the school was dark. There was a song which went, when you come back, if you do come back. It was addressed to the American soldiers in France. There was a day when the children paraded in the street. They sang, marching through Georgia, a song of victory from the Civil War. Now it celebrated a different victory, Kaiser Wilhelm would no longer haunt the children's dreams. Summer meant sunshine and lakes and crickets. The peaches dropped to the ground and were speared by the stubble. A day was indivisible, had no hours. The dark brought the voices of the night insects. But school went on for many years. Discipline was strict. The idea of escape took root and grew. A night with thunder in the sky, he packed his bag and left. The SS Rindam was old and slow. This was its last voyage. Passengers for Boulogne went ashore in a dinghy, rocked by the waves. At dawn, the empty streets of Paris were clean and shining. This was 57 years ago. Things are different now. The excitements of Paris, the Café du Dôme, La Mosquée, the Théâtre du Grand Guignol, Le Bal Negre de la Rue Blomé. He worked for 40 francs a week and sometimes was hungry. Then a girl he'd known from childhood came through Paris and saved him. He wandered on the Côte d'Azur in Switzerland and along the paths of the Schwarzwald. He was happy and he wrote words which he imagined made poems. That winter in New York, Aaron Copeland told him, you should become a composer. It will be difficult, he thought, but why not try?
The Moorish Sultan, who had suffered at Sierra Morena such a defeat by the Spaniards that for several days the victors used no other fuel than the pikes, lances, and arrows of their fallen enemies, answered his captors with great dignity that he had lately read the book of Paul's epistles, which he liked so much that were he to choose another faith, it should be Christianity. But for his part, Nazarenes have the minds of small children, he thought every man should die in the religion into which he was born. And this will probably not get through into those pork nourished brains. The only fault I find with Paul is that he deserted Judaism, he told them, smiling. Soon he was in Paris again. He admired Gertrude Stein. She told him he was not a poet, so he stopped trying to be one. This meant that he devoted himself only to music. Miss Stein did not like the music either. In Hanover, he stayed with Kurt Schwitters. He went with him to the city dumping ground and they collected material for the Merzbau. In Berlin, he wrote music, and people shouted, Fenster zu! In Paris, they cried, Fermez la fenêtre! In Tangier, only Copeland and the Cicadas could hear him. In the Sahara, he fell in love with the sky and knew that he would keep returning there. returned to America, but first he sailed to Puerto Rico. That way he stayed outside the cage a little longer. In New York, he thought only of Morocco. Like a convict planning a prison break, he prepared his escape, and summer found him sailing toward the east. He stayed in Fez this time. And although his parents awaited him in New York, he went to South America to see how it looked. But he did not stay. My dear Freddy, I did not answer sooner because being a little troubled about you, I wanted to see Harry first. No, I have, and as it seems that you are really not well, don't you think it would be best to come to Paris where you can be looked after and then we all can decide what you ought to do. You poor boy, it's bad to be all alone and I do think that you had better come here don't you? Always go to the stein. He was in California writing music. He was in New York writing music. Orson Welles wanted music for two plays, and he provided it. Jane Auer appeared on the scene and they set out for Mexico. The day after they arrived in Mexico City, Jane disappeared. Much later, they heard she had gone to Arizona. After a few months, they went on to Guatemala. It was very fine. He hurried to New York to orchestrate his first ballet. He took Jane Auer to hear it played by the Philadelphia Orchestra. Soon, Jane Auer became Jane Bowles. With too much luggage, they boarded a Japanese ship 
and went southward. Then they were in Guanacaste with the monkeys and parrots, and they carried a parrot with them from Costa Rica to Guatemala. They were on the Côte d'Azur when Chamberlain visited Munich. They were in New York when Hitler marched eastward. He was writing music for theater and film directors, and Jane was writing a novel. It was growing faintly light. There were camels near where he was lying. He could hear their gurgling and their heavy breathing. He could not bring himself to attempt opening his eyes just in case it should turn out to be impossible. However, when he heard someone approaching, he found that he had no difficulty in seeing. The man looked at him dispassionately in the gray morning light. With one hand, he pinched together the professor's nostrils. When the professor opened his mouth to breathe, the man swiftly seized his tongue and pulled on it with all his might. The professor was gagging and catching his breath. He did not see what was happening. He could not distinguish the pain of the brutal yanking from that of the sharp knife. Then there was an endless choking and spitting that went on automatically, as though he was scarcely a part of it. The word operation kept going through his mind. It calmed his terror somewhat as he sank back into darkness. The caravan left sometime toward mid-morning. The professor, not unconscious, but in a state of utter stupor, still gagging and drooling blood, was dumped, doubled up into a sack and tied at one side of a camel. The lower end of the enormous amphitheater contained a natural gate in the rocks. The camels, swift mehara, were lightly laden on this trip. They passed through a single file and slowly mounted the gentle slope that led up into the beginning of the desert. That night, at a stop behind some low hills, the men took him out, still in a state which permitted no thought, and over the dusty rags that remained of his clothing, they fastened a series of curious belts made of the bottoms of tin cans strung together. One after another of these bright girdles was wired about his torso, his arms and legs, even across his face, until he was entirely within a suit of armor that covered him with his circular metal scales. There was a good deal of merriment during this decking out of the professor. One man brought out a flute, and a younger one did a not ungraceful caricature of an Uled Nile executing a cane dance. The professor was no longer conscious. To be exact, he existed in the middle of the movements made by these other men. When they had finished dressing him the way they wished him to look, they stuffed some food under the tin bangles hanging over his face. Even though he chewed mechanically, most of it eventually fell out onto the ground. They put him back into the sack and left him there. The rooming house where they lived that winter was run by the poet Auden. At half past six each morning, Jane met the poet in the dining room. Jane was a friend of Thomas Mann's daughter, Erika, and Auden had married her. They had things to talk about. Soon they were back in Mexico. He was composing a sarsuela, and Jane was writing a novel. One day she came to the end of it. The next day, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. He was still working on the Sarsuela. He was also writing a second ballet. They went to New York, and he became a music critic. Jane's novel was published, and Leonard Bernstein conducted the Sarsuela.
collaborating with Salvador Dali, he wrote a third ballet. Then he began to write short stories and grew tired of writing theater music. He went to Cuba and El Salvador. Jane was writing a play. He stopped being a music critic, but continued to write music for Broadway. One night he dreamed he was in Morocco. The dream made him very happy. When they arrived at the Mungari's dwelling, he was making tea. He looked up and a chill moved along his spine. He began to scream his innocence at them. They said nothing, but at the point of a ruffle, bound him and tossed him into the corner where he continued to babble and sob. Quietly, they drank the tea he had been brewing, made some more and went out at twilight. They tied him to one of the mihara and mounting their own, moved in a silent procession, silent save for the Mungari, out through the town gate into the infinite wasteland beyond. Half the night they continued until they were in a completely unfrequented region of the desert. While he lay raving bound to the camel, they dug a well-like pit. And when they had finished, they lifted him off, still trussed tightly and stood him in it. Then they filled all the space around his body with sand and stones until only his head remained above the earth's surface. In the faint light of the new moon, his shaved pate without its turban looked rather like a rock. And still he pleaded with them calling upon Allah and Sidi Ahmed bin Musa to witness his innocence. But he might have been singing a song for all the attention they paid to his words. Presently they set off for Tessalit in no time, they were out of hearing. When they had gone, the Mungari fell silent to wait through the cold hours for the sun that would bring first warmth, then heat, thirst, fire, visions. The next night, he did not know where he was, did not feel the cold. The wind blew dust along the ground into his mouth as he sang. <laughs> Each time I go to a place I have not seen before, I hope it will be as different as possible from the places I already know. I assume it is natural for a traveler to seek diversity. 
and that it is the human element which makes him most aware of difference. If people and their manner of living were alike everywhere, there would not be much point in moving from one place to another. A publisher commissioned him to write a novel. He decided to leave New York and go back to Morocco. In Fez, he began to write The Sheltering Sky. He continued to write it as he moved here and there in the Sahara. He met Jane in Tangier and took her to Fez. A stream rushed by under their windows as they worked. He finished his novel. He had already written music for Tennessee Williams' first Broadway success. He was not surprised to learn that Tennessee wanted him for another play. He went to New York and wrote the score. Cause I won't buy love at the hardware store I don't want love from the mercantile store After the opening, he took Tennessee back to Morocco with him. The weather was bad, and Tennessee stayed less than a month. He and Jane were living at the Farha in Tangier. Truman Capote arrived. For six weeks, he amused them at mealtimes. There were many parties and picnics. Jane worked in her cottage, but he did not know what she was writing. He was chagrined to hear that the publishers did not want his book. We expected a novel, they said, and this is not a novel. So it was published first in London. They went to England and stayed a few weeks in Wiltshire. Jane wanted to spend the winter in Paris. He decided on Sri Lanka. 
On the ship, he started a novel about Tangier. When he arrived in Paris, Jane was not ready to leave. He was making an opera out of Garcia Lorca's Yerma. This was for Libby Holman. They spent a month together in Andalusia. Autumn in Fez, winter and spring in the Sahara. Jane wanted to return to Morocco. He drove to the French frontier and picked her up. But she liked Spain so much that they spent a month there. She finished her play and went to New York. He finished his novel and went to Bombay. As he passed the small door, he peered through the low transom above it and saw her lying beside a man on the floor. The two were asleep and half clothed. In the warm air that came through the screen transom, there was the smell of whiskey that had been drunk and whiskey that had been spilled. He went upstairs, his heart beating violently. In the cabin, he closed her two valises, packed his own, set them all together by the door and laid the raincoats on top of them. He put on his shirt, combed his hair carefully, and went on deck. Sienega was there ahead in the mountain's morning shadow. The dock, a line of huts against the jungle behind, and the railway station to the right, beyond the village. As they docked, he signaled the two urchins who were waving for his attention, screaming, equipajes. They fought a bit with one another until he made them see his two fingers held aloft. Then to make them certain, he pointed at each of them in turn, and they grinned. Still grinning, they stood behind him with the bags and coats, and he was among the first of the upper deck passengers to get on land. They went down the street to the station with the parrots screaming at them from each thatched gable along the way. On the crowded waiting train, with the luggage finally in the rack, his heart beat harder than ever, and he kept his eyes painfully on the long, dusty street that led back to the dock. At the far end, as the whistle blew, he thought he saw a figure in white running among the dogs and children toward the station. But the train started up as he watched, and the street was lost to view. He took out his notebook and sat with it on his lap smiling at the shining green landscape that moved with increasing speed past the window.
Midsummer, he was in Venice. He was in Madrid when a wire came from Ceylon. It was possible now to buy a small island off the coast of Sri Lanka. He bought it and went to New York to write music for Jane's play. In the summer, he was in Rome, working on a film for Visconti. He did not know what he was doing, but he did it anyway. That winter in Tangier, William Burroughs came to see him. In the summer, he started to write a third novel, this one about Fez. It was half finished when he and Jane sailed to pass the winter on Taprobane, the island off the coast of Sri Lanka. Jane was not well. She was not happy there. After two months, she returned to Tangier. He finished his novel and took a cruise to Japan. Then he went back to Morocco. He did not think of himself as a tourist. He was a traveler. The difference is partly one of time, he would explain. Whereas the tourist generally hurries back home at the end of a few weeks or months, the traveler, belonging no more to one place than the next, moves slowly over periods of years from one part of the earth to another. Another important difference between tourist and traveler is that the former accepts his own civilization without question not so the traveler, who compares it with the others and rejects those he finds not to his liking. Muezzin called from the minaret of the Qutubia. He of the assembly thought of being in the Agdal. The great mountains were ahead of him, and the olive trees stood in rows on each side of him. Then he heard the trickle of water, and he remembered the sigya that is there in the Agdal, and he swiftly came back to the cafe of the two bridges. Aisha Kandisha can be only where there are trees by running water. She comes only for single men by trees and fresh moving water. Her arms are gold and she calls in the voice of the most cherished one. Bentazia gave him the sebsi. He filled it and smoked it. When a man sees her face, he will never see another woman's face. He will make love with her all the night and every night and in the sunlight by the walls before the eyes of children. Soon he will be an empty pod and he will leave this world for his home in Jehennem. While he was in Kenya, Jane suffered a stroke. He took her to England to be examined. The doctors could do nothing, and they returned to Tangier. 
Soon she became worse and had to go to London again. It was a bad time. In Madeira, her health grew worse. She was obliged to go to New York. Tennessee, who loved her, came from Florida to meet her at the airport. The Garcia Lorca opera was produced. It was not a success. Libby Holman had worked very hard, but there was no director. He and Jane went back to Tangier, but then a telegram came from Tennessee saying he needed music for a new play. He sent him the script for Sweet Bird of Youth. Part of the music was written in Tangier and part on the New York bound ship. The Rockefeller Foundation gave him a grant to record music in Morocco. He spent six months taping music in the mountains, the desert, and the cities. stays that way. It's not likely to, of course, what with television and other newfangled inventions, <laughs> phonograph records, <laughs> cinema, and so on, things which didn't exist when I first came here. And of course, much easier to keep the music pure if you don't have to listen to things recorded in studios. If you don't ever hear commercial music, for instance, but of course, in every country, the traditional music uh, becomes commercialized little by little. And in the end, it drops dead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the way of the world. You leave the gate of the fort or the town behind, past the camels lying outside, go up into the dunes or out into the hard stony plain and stand a while alone. Presently, you will either shiver and hurry back inside the walls, or you will go on standing there and let something very peculiar happen to you, something that everyone who lives there has undergone and which the French call le baptême de la solitude, it is a unique sensation, and it has nothing to do with loneliness, for loneliness presupposes memory. Here in this holy mineral landscape, lighted by stars like flares, even memory disappears. Nothing is left but your own breathing and the sound of your heart beating. A strange, and by no means pleasant, process of reintegration begins inside you, and you have the choice of fighting against it and insisting on remaining the person you have always been or letting it take its course. For no one who has stayed in the Sahara for a while is quite the same as when he came.
Jane's health was now less good. They went twice to America, saw their parents, consulted doctors who might be of use, but no doctor could be of use. In Tangier and the Monte Viejo, he wrote his fourth novel. The publisher asked him to write a book about Cairo. He did not want to do it, so he playfully suggested Bangkok. The publisher agreed. He went to Bangkok via Panama. After four months, the Thai authorities forced him to leave. In Tangier, he found that Jane needed to be hospitalized. He took her to Spain. Then he agreed to go to California to teach. He told his students that he was not a teacher and could not teach. They laughed, thinking he was eccentric. After the first semester, he returned to Morocco. He began to translate Moroccan storytellers. There was a woman who used to go to the beach to pray. And she would say, My Muna loves God, and God loves my Muna. And one day a man came by, and he heard the woman praying in her way. And he said, But that's not the way to pray. This is the way to do it. And he showed her how. And he had a little rug with him which he placed on the water and then he sat on the rug and went speeding across the water. And Maimuna began praying using the words that the man had uh, given her. But she forgot a part of it. And she looked and saw the man going across the water on his rug. And she began to call after him and she ran down to the water. And the man <clears throat> turned around and saw her running on top of the water after him. And he said, what do you want? She said, you'll have to tell me those words again. And he said, to, he looked at her and said to her, I, who am a saint, need a rug to go on the water. But you go back and pray any way you want. Jane begged to be taken back to Tangier. The doctors advised against it. Nevertheless, he took her back with him because she was so unhappy. It was a disaster. She would not eat and grew weak and thin. He admitted defeat and returned her to the hospital in Spain. She remained there. She died there. Her grave is unmarked. After that, it seemed to him that nothing more happened. 
If I am here now, it is only because I was still here when I realized to what an extent the world had worsened and that I no longer wanted to travel. In defense of the city of Tangier, I can say that so far it has been touched by fewer of the negative aspects of contemporary civilization than most cities of its size. More important than that, I relish the idea that in the night all around me in my sleep, sorcery is burrowing its invisible tunnels in every direction, from thousands of senders to thousands of unsuspecting recipients. Spells are being cast, poison is running its course, souls are being dispossessed of parasitic pseudo-consciousnesses that lurk in the unguarded recesses of the mind. There's drumming out there most nights. It never awakens me. I hear the drums and incorporate them into my dream like the nightly cries of the muezzins. Even if in the dream I'm in New York, the first Allah Akbar effaces the backdrop and carries whatever comes next to North Africa, and the dream goes on. He went on living in Tangier, translating from Arabic, French, and Spanish. He wrote many short stories, but no novels. There continued to be more and more people in the world, and there was nothing anyone could do about anything. Writing an autobiography is not the kind of work one would expect most writers to enjoy doing. And it is clear that telling what happened does not necessarily make a good story. In my tale, for instance, there are no dramatic victories because there was no struggle. I hung on and waited. It seems to me that this must be what most people do. The occasions when there is the possibility of doing more than that are becoming rare indeed. The Moroccans claim that full participation in life demands the regular contemplation of death. I agree without reserve. Unfortunately, I am unable to conceive of my own death without setting it in the far more terrible mise-en-scene of old age. There I am without teeth, unable to move, wholly dependent upon someone whom I pay to take care of me and who at any moment may go out of the room and never return. Of course, this is not at all what the Moroccans mean by the contemplation of death. They would consider my imaginings a particularly contemptible form of fear. One culture's therapy is another culture's torture. Goodbye, says the dying man to the mirror they hold in front of him. We won't be seeing each other anymore. When I quoted Valérie's epigram in The Sheltering Sky, it seemed a poignant bit of fantasy. Now because I no longer imagine myself as an onlooker at the scene, but instead, as the principal protagonist, it strikes me as repugnant. To make it right, the dying man would have to add two words to his little farewell, and they are, thank God. <laughs> 